on World News Tonight. Rescue effort. Rescue efforts continue in Indonesia as the death toll keeps mounting following the major earthquake. Nuclear tensions. UN Security Council holds open meetings on North Korea's recent ICBM launch. Orion in orbit. Mankind takes another step forward in space exploration with Orion taking a record-breaking lap around the moon. And festive France. The Champs-Élysées awes visitors with the bright new look for the holidays. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now in Indonesia, officials said over 160 were killed and 300 injured after the 5.6 quake struck the Kianjo region in West Java province, about 100 kilometers from the capital Jakarta. The race to search for any survivors trapped under the rubble continues, though there isn't much hope left. Residents of Sianjur rushed relatives to safety, whilst overwhelmed emergency workers treated victims wherever they could. Over a hundred have died, and many are still believed to be trapped under rubble after the strong, shallow earthquake shook the island. Overcome with emotion in the face of disaster, the town's administration head broke down. <laughs> A lot of houses were destroyed in the villages, and we need heavy equipment for that. And a lot of roads were cut off. We are still gathering data for that. Many people have died. The quake has left thousands of residents displaced after damaging at least 1,700 houses and leaving hospitals without power for several hours. Sianjur is the epicenter of the 5.6 magnitude quake, it's located 100 kilometers south of Jakarta. The shock was felt as far as the capital, shaking skyscrapers and forcing thousands to evacuate. We are used to this in Jakarta, but people were so nervous just now, so we also panicked. Indonesia is no stranger to earthquakes due to its position on the Pacific Ring of Fire, where tectonic plates collide. With the release of video footage that allegedly showed Ukrainian forces killing Russian troops who had apparently laid down their weapons in eastern Ukraine, the two countries have been accusing each other of committing war crimes. Meanwhile, the UN Human Rights Office had called for a full investigation. The New York Times says it has verified footage that shows Ukrainian forces killing at least 11 Russian troops. It says Sunday that the video footage circulated on Russian social media allegedly shows Ukrainian forces opening fire on Russian troops who may have been trying to surrender. Videos of the alleged shooting emerged between November 12th and 17th as Kyiv recaptured parts of the country's eastern Luhansk region. Russia jumped to accuse Ukraine of committing war crimes, with its authorities saying that it has opened a criminal investigation. Moscow's foreign ministry demanded an international investigation on what it called a, quote, merciless and a shocking shooting. To this, however, Ukraine's commissioner for human rights dismissed the accusation, stressing that returning fire is not a war crime. The official added that Russian soldiers had feigned surrender and subsequently one of them opened fire. A spokesperson for the UN Human Rights Office says the global body was looking into the footage and called for the allegations to be investigated promptly and in full scale. Against this backdrop, more than 8,300 civilians, including over 400 children, are believed to have died since Russia's invasion of Ukraine early this year. That's according to investigators in Kyiv, who say the actual number of victims is likely to be much higher, as Ukraine does not yet have access to some areas of the country being occupied by Russia. The United Nations Security Council has held an emergency meeting over North Korea's recent test firing of an intercontinental ballistic missile, despite U.S.-led efforts to hold Pyongyang accountable for its missile tests. No meaningful actions were seen at the talks due to the veto powers of China and Russia. The UN Security Council held an open meeting on Monday to discuss North Korea's latest intercontinental ballistic missile test. But the session again ended with the Council failing to reach a unified response. 
At the meeting, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield said failure to take action has allowed the North to continue its provocations. Sixty-three times this year, the DPRK has flagrantly violated Security Council resolutions and attempted to undermine the global nonproliferation regime. Sixty-three times this year, the DPRK has shown an utter disregard for the safety and security of the region and a complete lack of respect to this council. The U.S. ambassador stressed it was their 10th Security Council meeting of the year with no significant action taken against the regime's provocative actions, even despite eight rounds of ICBM tests by North Korea this year. She also called out China and Russia for emboldening Pyongyang by preventing council action. South Korea's ambassador Hwang jun guk voiced similar concerns. Mr. President, we have witnessed how the DPRK is fully taking advantage of the Council's inaction and divisions to build up its nuclear arsenal and promulgated its new law on nuclear weapons policy, which set the threshold for using nuclear weapons far lower than any other country. South Korea's ambassador added that the long-time military exercises held by Seoul and Washington could never be an excuse for Pyongyang's illicit actions. Despite condemnation from most council members, China and Russia dismissed calls to hold Pyongyang accountable for its missile tests. The two veto-wielding members argue that the Security Council should not pressure the North and instead should play a constructive role on the issue to ease tensions. On Friday, North Korea fired a new Hwasong-17 ICBM in what analysts believe may be the first successful launch of the system. The new weapon is expected to have a range of up to 15,000 kilometers, which is far enough to hit the U.S. mainland. Seoul and Washington now say that the regime is ready for a nuclear test, which would be its first since 2017. The UK-EU partnership that was on the horizon just a few months back has now been cut down to its roots with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak claiming that there will not be any trade deals struck under the necessity of aligning with EU laws. New UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has ruled out striking a trade deal with the EU based on aligning with the bloc's laws. He spoke Monday to a gathering of business leaders. On, on trade, let me be unequivocal about this. Uh, under my leadership, the United Kingdom will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU laws. Now, I voted for Brexit. I believe in Brexit. And I know that Brexit can deliver, and is already delivering, enormous benefits and opportunities for the country. Sunak made the denial following weekend media reports. The Sunday Times newspaper said a deal based on alignment was being considered. It said that would be similar to the arrangement for Switzerland, which has access to the single market in return for adhering to certain budget conditions. Some of Sunak's conservative lawmakers responded angrily, saying alignment would mean subservience to EU rules. On Monday, the UK leader also promised further action on illegal migrants. Well, I think the country's number one priority right now when it comes to migration is tackling illegal migration. It's stopping people coming here illegally on small boats across the channel. Because when people see that happening, it undermines trust in the system. It doesn't seem fair that people are able to break the rules. Britain left the EU in 2020, but has faced continued wrangling over the shape of its future trading relationship with the bloc. Potential Republican presidential hopefuls are gearing up for the 2024 election while taking on former President Donald Trump. Trump recently stated that there is no other road to victory than mega, while others of his party exclaim support for being a never again Trumper. Donald Trump is blasting critics in his own party tonight, defending his MAGA candidates who took heavy losses in the midterms, echoing his false claims of a stolen election. The former president posting to social media, quote, candidates who shifted their messaging after winning big in the primaries, Bullduck, saw big losses in the general. Will they ever learn their lesson? You can't win without MAGA. Trump speaking via satellite at the Republican Jewish Coalition meeting in Las Vegas over the weekend as the only declared candidate for president. We have to stay strong and we have to 
fight. And frankly, uh, you better hope that a certain person wins the election in 2024. Doubling down on his platform amid questions about this latest run. When we win in 2024, the era of backstabbing and betrayal will end and the United States will stand with Israel once more, just as it did in my administration. The former president met with intense opposition from potential Republican challengers. The job of a leader is to take the arrows so that his people doesn't have to. So I always said throughout all that, I am much more worried about protecting the jobs of the people that I represent than I'm worried about saving my own. Let the politics sort itself out. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and potential Trump adversary continuing to hint at a 2024 bid. We've accomplished more over a four-year period than anybody thought possible. But I can tell you this, we've got a lot more to do, and I have only begun to fight. Even some of Trump's previously close allies launching criticism at the former president, including one of his closest advisors. We keep losing and losing and losing. And the fact of the matter is the reason we're losing is because Donald Trump has put himself before everybody else. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley says she's just getting started, denouncing Trump's leadership without saying his name. We don't need more politicians who love to go on TV and talk about our problems. We need real leaders with a record of delivering solutions. The GOP's new anti-Trump sentiments coming as Trump considers a big return to Twitter. Twitter owner Elon Musk recently reinstating Trump's account. But the former president saying he'll stick to his social media platform, Truth Social, for now. Truth Social has been very, very powerful, very, very strong. And I'll be staying there, but I hear we're getting a big vote to also go back on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't see it because I don't see any reason for it. Let's go into a short commercial break. More news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Iran is under fire following its own firing of attacks against Kurdish militant bases. The act caused global disapproval with the Iranian football team at FIFA, refraining from singing the national anthem before the game. Once a base for the Kurdish Khomala militant group, now a pile of rubble. These images from a Kurdish news agency purport to show the aftermath of an Iranian drone and missile strike. Iran's Revolutionary Guard said it hit two Kurdish camps and a town in northern Iraq, targeting what it calls separatist anti-Iranian terrorist groups. Tehran accuses them of stoking violent protests that have rocked the country for the past two months. Iranian Kurdistan is one of the strongholds of the demonstrations, making it a target for repression. Like here in the town of Piran Shah, where continuous gunfire can be heard in the distance. Other cities targeted by the Revolutionary Guard include Mahabad and Sakez, the hometown of Masa Amini. The 22-year-old's death while in custody of Iran's morality police sparked the protest movement. Greatly concerned that Iranian authorities are reportedly escalating violence against protesters, particularly in the city of Mahabad. We continue to pursue accountability for those involved as we support the Iranian people. To protest against the crackdown, businesses in Iranian Kurdistan have shuttered their doors, maintaining a general strike. NASA's Orion spacecraft has successfully completed its flight around the moon, getting as close as 130 kilometers above the lunar surface. The mission is a crucial first step in NASA's goal to establish a manned research based on the moon before the end of the decade. NASA's successful flight around the moon by the Artemis 1 spacecraft is the first part of the space agency's latest lunar exploration program. Orion completed its flight around the moon on Monday. This spacecraft had been cruising toward the moon since its November 16th launch and was not only unmanned, but also completed a crucial engine burn relatively close to the moon while out of communication with NASA. At the time of the burn, Orion was 370,000 miles from Earth, traveling at 8,083 kilometers per hour, some 530 kilometers above the moon. The spacecraft skimmed the lunar surface, coming as close as 130 kilometers away. 
The flyby burn began at 7.44 a.m. Eastern Time, but from Orion's location on the far side of the moon, radio signals from Earth were unable to reach it, and it wasn't until 7.59 a.m. that Orion reacquired its signal with NASA. Monday's successful burn sets in motion the next crucial step on November 25th, when an engine firing will insert Orion into a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. Just yesterday, we entered the lunar sphere of influence at 2.09 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll remain in that sphere of influence, meaning uh, oh, the moon has the greatest gravitational pull on Orion until we prepare for distant retrograde insertion. So we anticipate uh, to exit the gravitational sphere of influence of the moon on Thursday, November 24th. The spacecraft will remain on a stable orbit until December 1st, when another engine burn will launch the capsule back toward Earth. Orion is set to return home, landing in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California on December 11th. Kenya is ready to offer a helping hand to the Dominican Republic of Congo in order to quell the unrest that is increasing in intensity over the country's Far East. That is according to the Kenya's President William Ruto, who paid his first state visit to the country. In his first state visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenyan President William Ruto said his country's troops will do whatever it takes to bring stability to the DRC's Far East. Peaceful, unsecure, unstable Eastern DRC. And DRC is not only good for the people of Congo, it is good for the people of our region. I have come to confirm to my brother and to the people of DRC that Kenya will play its role. Kenyan troops touched down in the DRC earlier this month, joining an East African regional force that is aiming to end decades of bloodshed. More than 120 armed groups continue to operate across large parts of East Congo, despite billions of dollars spent on one of the United Nations' largest peacekeeping forces. We are acutely aware that we have many, keep, many peacekeeping troops in DRC. But from where we sit as a region, we do not think there is much peace to keep. In April, the seven countries of the East African Community, or EAC, agreed to set up a force to fight the militia groups. Among them are M23 rebels who have staged a major offensive this year, seizing territory and forcing thousands of people from their homes. Congo has repeatedly accused Rwanda of backing the M23 group, a claim Rwanda denies. For his part, DRC President Felix Chisichetti thanked Ruto for his commitment to help the country find peace. Also on Monday, regional neighbor Uganda said it would send a thousand troops, the third country to contribute after Burundi and Kenya. The fears of COVID-19 is not just amongst the medical field now as Wall Street is taking a precautionary route in response to China's ever-tightening COVID curbs. Its main indexes now ended on a low due to the fear of the restrictions hindering the economy as it is projected to do so. Wall Street's main indexes ended down on Monday on fears that China could resume stricter measures to fight COVID-19 after it said it faces its most severe test of the pandemic. The Dow shaved just over a tenth of a percent, the S&P dropped nearly four-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq lost more than one percent. Beijing on Monday said it would shut businesses and schools in hard-hit districts and tighten rules for entering the city as infections ticked higher, spooking investors. U.S. casino operators with businesses in China, including Wynn Resorts, Las Vegas Sands, MGM Resorts International, and Melco Resorts and Entertainment, all fell at least 2 percent. In other movers, Walt Disney jumped 6.3 percent on the news of Bob Iger's return as chief executive to the entertainment giant. And Tesla plummeted nearly 7 percent after the electric car maker said it will recall vehicles in the U.S. over an issue that may cause taillights to sometimes fail to illuminate. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
A coalition of rights activists urged Twitter's advertisers to issue statements about pulling their ads off the social media platform after its owner Elon Musk lifted the ban on tweets by former US President Donald Trump. Buses were set on fire in South Africa's Cape Town as local taxi associations embarked on a two-day strike to protest against the termination of an incentive program. For the next four weeks, South Koreans are urged to receive boosters and retool coronavirus vaccine shots. During the period, reservations won't be required and incentives will be provided to those getting inoculated. Eight people died after a small plane crashed into the residential area of Colombia's second largest city of Medellin. The plane broke into three parts and at least six buildings were hit and seven homes were totally destroyed. Buildings were left damaged and widespread power outages reported in Solomon Islands capital Honiara after two earthquakes struck just off the southwest coast. The first magnitude 7.0 earthquake briefly triggered a tsunami warning while a second quake with a magnitude of 6.0 struck nearby 30 minutes later. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with visuals of Sean Elise lighting up for the Christmas season. Stay safe and have a good night.